My name is Bert Patnod. I teach history uh, here at Stanford University. And uh, at Stanford, I teach a seminar called Famine in the Modern World. Now, lately, the enrollments in that seminar, the number of students signing up to take it, um, that's on the rise. And I think it's because, in part, because famine is making a comeback. So, have a look at the map um, that I put up for you to look at, very recently made map. And until recently, most observers thought famine was becoming extinct through a combination of technological advances in food production and distribution, also economic growth, and a robust global humanitarianism. Through that combined, those combined forces, um, it appeared that famine was finally becoming a thing of the past. But then, in 2011, there was a famine in Somalia. You see it there if you look on your map in the extreme east of Africa, the Horn of Africa. Somalia in 2011, a moderate to major famine, um, told us that the outlook was too optimistic, that in fact, famine was not going away. In that 2011 famine in Somalia, uh, 260,000 people died, more than half of them under the age of five. Now, the population of Somalia back in 2011, 13 million. Today, it's 17 million. Uh, but this is a sizable amount, a quarter of a million people out of a population of 13 million. So this is what that famine looks like. This is what a young famine victim looks like. We'll see more such photos um, in the few minutes ahead. Um, since 2011, there have been a couple of more famines declared in Africa, and very importantly, there were several near misses in places um, like Somalia and also uh, Yemen. If you look uh, again back at your map, you will see across from Somalia, across the Gulf of Aden, uh, you will see Yemen, still a very uh, troubled spot. Okay, and then comes COVID-19, the pandemic, which really comes into um, uh, fruition in 2020, and the effects of COVID-19 on economies and on supply chains had many people, many observers of famine, beginning to fear the worst when it came to what we call acute food insecurity. And the effects of COVID-19 have actually proven to be enduring. Uh, and the numbers of acutely food insecure people, and that's around the world, uh, have continued to increase through the pandemic and beyond. And now, today, in 2023, the war in Ukraine, which broke out a year ago, is threatening to disrupt food supplies and the stability of the global food market. So that's the big picture trajectory. Let's start with a basic question. What is famine? Uh, what causes it? And why is it seemingly a rising threat once again? Famine can be defined as it is by one expert in the field, and I quote, as an extreme event in which a large number of people in a given population or geographic area suffers inadequate access to food, usually because their livelihoods have been damaged or destroyed. This leads to widespread malnutrition, ill health, and death. So that's a pretty good technical definition. And what I'm going to do now with these next few slides is illustrate that and sort of bring it home to you, give you a real sense of what famine looks like and what causes famine. And to do that, I'm going to take you on a little excursion. Um, I am uh, a research fellow actually, at the Hoover Institution Library and Archives here on the Stanford campus. And in that capacity, I served as curator 
of an exhibition still ongoing. As you see here from the slide, it's called Bread and Medicine, and it focuses on a famine that happened 100 years ago in Soviet Russia and Ukraine. So we're talking about 1921 to 22, mostly. There was a massive famine and there was a massive American relief effort undertaken by an organization called the American Relief Administration. And the papers of that organization are located in the Hoover Archives here on the Stanford campus. And those papers serve as the basis for the exhibition. So I'm gonna show you some images from the exhibition, give you a sense of what famine looks like. We start with a poster. This is a poster put out by the Soviet government in Moscow back in the summer of 1921 when it was becoming clear that a major famine was looming. The, that's Russian script there, Russian uh, um, uh, language. And what it says is stop this flow of the starving through your comradely aid. So essentially what they're telling people is, we've got to stop the tide, the flood of refugees. And you can see these people have left their homes, they've abandoned their homes way in the background. You see uh, famine represented by uh, a skeleton with a scythe there that's deaf. And these refugees are spreading disease throughout the country, so beyond the so-called famine zone. And by the way, I'll have a map up for you in a moment. Many of these people are heading to Ukraine, the breadbasket of Russia in the old days. They think they're going to find salvation there. Now let's show you what this really looks like. When the American relief workers arrive in September of 1921, they are in the Volga River Valley. And again, I'll show you on the map in a moment. And the American com Americans come upon many scenes such as this one, that autumn of 1921. People are waiting for a train, trying to get out of town, trying to flee the famine. The Americans also run into scenes such as this. Um, and I'm going lightly on the, the horror imagery here as we do in the exhibition. So there are millions of orphans already in the fall of 1921, and many end up in these so-called children's homes where, as you can see, there's very little in the way of food, blankets, places to sleep, and it's also a place where disease is spread, right? So one more photo that's a little difficult to look at. And this, you see these five children here. This is also uh, in the Volga region uh, in Samara, and there's a caption written on the front of the photo. You see the emaciation, so you can actually see the rib cage on, on a couple of these kids. But also look at the swollen bellies, the so-called hunger edema. These kids are eating food substitutes. There's no real food to eat. They're eating grass, clay, twigs, leaves, bark, ground up bones, and a lot worse than that. Um, anything they could find to stay alive. Okay, what caused that famine? back in Russia and Ukraine a century ago? Well, it starts with uh, dislocations of the First World War, 1914 to 1918. There is a revolution, actually two revolutions, in Russia in 1917, so great disruption. Then there's a civil war, 1918 to 1920, and very often forgotten, and I'll come back to this later, the Soviet communist government under Vladimir Lenin is confiscating grain from the peasants. This means that when the drought hits, which is 1920-21, the peasants have no reserve of grain to fall back on, and it's a major famine. At least six million people will perish in this famine of 1921-22. Now the experts on famine today are pretty clear on a few things, and this is one of them, that we have to think about famines in terms of old famines and new famines. Old famines were those caused by some event related to climate, might be drought, might be floods, something in the environment, pests, plant diseases, etc., and that this resulted in crop failures that led to famine. 
So those are sort of old-fashioned or old famines. New famines, on the other hand, begin with the start of the 20th century, and those famines, and those are the ones we live with today, uh, tend to be triggered by political crises, wars, uh, civil wars, so some sort of violent conflict, and also totalitarian rule, authoritarian rule. And that's the story with the famine whose victims you're looking at in this slide. After World War I, there was widespread hunger across Europe, but only in Soviet Russia, with a communist government in charge, was there mass starvation, so genuine famine. Here's the map that I promised you. You see here, we called it Soviet Russia back in those days. It's actually a complicated administrative setup, but you see to the lower left that there is a Ukraine there, actually a technically independent Ukraine back in 1921. It's connected to the government in Moscow, the Russian government. And of course, you see down in the Black Sea, the port of Odessa. And by the way, this map uses the older spellings. We've updated these since Ukrainian has become a respected language, right? So you see Kiev there. It's now Kiev. Odessa only has one S. Um, and here on the map, it has two. Um, that's the port of Odessa that Ukraine uses to export grain and other agricultural products and it's under threat today. I'll come back to that at the very end. Now, don't lose me here. A decade later, we can still use this map. A decade later, this place became known as the Soviet Union, the USSR. And there would be a second, another catastrophic famine. This is 1932-33. The Soviet leader is, at the time, Joseph Stalin. And Stalin introduces the collectivization of agriculture, drive all the peasants onto collective farms. There is resistance, and the, the, the furor and the disorder leads to mass starvation. And Stalin's government policies actually exacerbate that famine, especially in Ukraine. And today that famine, where millions, probably four to five million Ukrainians died, is remembered there as the Holodomor, Ukrainian word, which means killing by starvation, kind of a sacred term for Ukrainians. So we have two big Soviet famines uh, caused in part by politics uh, in the 20th century, but the biggest of them all, uh, as measured by the loss of human life, certainly, the most catastrophic famine of the 20th century was in China. And that's the so-called Great Leap Famine, which starts in the late 1950s when Mao Zedong and the communists attempt to, sounds like Stalin, right? Attempt to move peasants onto communes in an effort to industrialize the country. That program is called the Great Leap Forward. So the famine that resulted is called the Great Leap Famine. Uh, it lasts until about 1962. Now the estimated total number of deaths brace yourselves, goes, ranges from 15 million, that's the low, low, low side, to 45 million people died in this famine. So that's the, the benchmark for the, the really bad famines of the, of the recent period, of the new famines. As totalitarian governments fade away toward the end of the 20th century, episodes of famine also decline, as does the number of people dying from them. Um, I would stress one point here that's often missed when people discuss famine, and that is most people caught up in a famine do not die of outright starvation. In fact, they die of famine-related disease, infectious disease. It's mostly because severe malnutrition makes people, especially young children, who are the first victims in a famine, it makes them more susceptible to Disease, as I said earlier, in that Somalia famine in 2011, half the victims uh, were under the age of five years old. So when the Americans go into Soviet Russia, they are on the lookout for the major disease killers there, typhus, cholera, typhoid, dysentery. 
And while they bring in food into kitchens, and this is a great photo here, a rural kitchen, that's, an, that's American food that's going to be served there in 1922. While they bring in food, they also realize they have to fight disease. And so they introduce a medical program with a large-scale vaccination campaign, primarily uh, to ward off cholera. And the children you see here in this photo, this is today we call the city St. Petersburg. This is an American kitchen. These kids are waiting to get their daily meal, but first they have to get their shot, right? Um, so they had an inducement uh, to get vaccinated. So a couple of general observations, and then we'll wind up. Incidences of famine were long thought to be related to population growth. Um, the idea was that population growth was always outpacing technological advances in production. So famines occurred as a kind of course correction, nature's way of reducing the world's population to more manageable size. Recent work of historians has demonstrated that in fact there's no direct relationship between famine in population size, going back at least 150 years. Also, famine has long been associated with some sort of natural disaster, drought, flood, crop or animal disease, etc. So usually it was presented back in the old times as an act of God, a kind of biblical event. But in fact, as we've seen, most famines are caused by a combination of factors. And today, the most common causal factor in almost all famines or near famine emergencies is war or uh, conflict of some kind. Okay, so we'll end where we started uh, with the Horn of Africa. One of the developments that grew out of the famine in Ethiopia, which you actually see on the map here, the double map, uh, the famine in Ethiopia in the 1980s was one of the last of the major famines, probably the last in the 20th century. That gave birth to the idea of creating a famine early warning system. The idea being you could track the causal factors and predict when and where famines were likely to occur. And if you could do that, it would inspire intervention either to head off the famine or provide humanitarian aid to people under threat. And the best known of these early warning efforts is US funded, and it's known as the Famine Early Warning System Network, or FUSENET. You see the name in the lower left part of the slide. It began in 1985. They have a terrific website, which is where I got these maps. You can get many others, and you can track uh, these situations. So finally, um, 2022 sees a rise in the number of numbers of acutely food insecure people. Today, the total is somewhere around 200 million. Um, and again, COVID-19 and the rise of food prices that result from the pandemic is part of that. The Ukraine war still is a wild card and still could disrupt food supplies worldwide because Ukraine is a major supplier of grain. Before World War I, it was known as the granary of Europe. But, and I will end on a sober or a sobering note, uh, things could get much worse very quickly if climate change continues to worsen as, as it appears to be doing at an alarming rate we may think that finding the political will to end famine, keeping the peace, preventing violent conflict will keep famine at bay, but we must be alert to the dangers of climate change. So look at the map of the Horn of Africa. You can see this is the weak spot. This is the vulnerable spot. And it is now, this part of the world is now suffering its fifth poor rainy season in a row, which has no precedent in recorded history. The worst of it on that map is southern Ethiopia and northern Kenya, and this is worth keeping an eye on. And we finish by zooming in here on Somalia, which once again since last September has been on the brink of famine, as this FuseNet map shows us. 
Um, and so we'll be keeping an eye on that as we go forward. But for all of us Americans, especially young Americans, famine is an issue that should be a concern to us. In a world where everything is interconnected, um, we need to be paying attention to the state of affairs with famine. We in the United States, where we have an abundance of food, can respond by supporting humanitarian efforts to alleviate mass starvation. But much more effective and certainly more humane would be to focus on the issues of global hunger and inequity, to look for long-term solutions to these problems. And I would say that fighting climate change is essential to this effort.